that look pretty straight to you guys? <laughs> Is it leaning to the right? Yeah, right there, perfect. Thank you. That's why we need firemen in the congregation to help us get things right. Thanks, brother. All right. Well, we're going to dive in to this continuing saga of Jacob. And I think we've said this before, but just in case we haven't, Many of you, or at least some of you, are probably familiar with the account that's still coming up of Jacob wrestling with God. But in reality, week after week, we're seeing Jacob wrestle with God, not always literally as he does later, but figuratively as he struggles with his own heart and bringing it into obedience to God. And today we're going to talk about a struggle I think is common for all of us, and that is when God sets up boundaries, we have to make sense of what we're going to do with God's boundaries, how we feel about his boundaries. And, and honestly, as, as people who are born into sin, most of us struggle with boundaries in general, and then especially with the boundaries that God sets up for us. It's, it's so easy, and, and we've all seen this in our two-year-olds, if you say, don't step beyond this line to do one of these, right? And even when you're an adult, we still struggle with those things. Now, I, I've come to appreciate boundaries over the ages. I'm thinking that many of you, when you think about my time in Zambia, think about the time that I lived off the grid, out in the bush, and, and maybe the picture in your mind is mud block huts and grass roofs, and certainly that was very much involved in the day-to-day -day of our life. But later on, Julie and I and our family, after about six years of being off grid, out in the bush, we moved into the city, the capital city of Lusaka. And these aren't actual pictures I'm going to show you of our house, but they're pictures of what you will see to this day if you go visit homes in urban areas in any part of southern Africa. I still return to Mozambique, a neighboring country to Zambia, and it looks very much like this. That's what a house looks like. See any houses there? No. Why? Because there's a very large, strong perimeter around it, a very large, strong boundary around it. And these little things on the gate, because these are here that could help someone climb, those are extremely sharp, razor sharp. In fact, many times, on top of the wall will be glass, broken glass, not nice smooth bottle glass, broken glass, concertina wire, and that's because in a third world country where there's a vast difference between the wealthy and the poor, there are some people who don't just look at the front door of a house and say, <laughs> Oh, I won't go in there. There's a boundary there. In fact, more than once it happened that one of our missionaries pulled up to here, got out of the car, and once one of our friends got out of the car with her child in the back seat, and some thieves came up and attempted to steal her car with her baby in it. She managed to get the baby out, but only because right here was a metal post, and the guy forgot to shut the door, and he hung the door of the car up on that metal post. And what does this look like from the inside? Well, this is a different wall, but it's going to look something like this. There's the house, and there's your perimeter. You see a different version of what happens 
with the gate, and it even looks like there might be some electric wire there. Now, you might think, as I did when I first got to Africa, I don't want that wall. That, that stinks that I have to put a big, tall wall around my home. And some of you might, might think, well, if I saw that around my home, I would feel extremely unsafe. But I want you to think for just a moment of what you might be able to keep out with a wall like that and what you might be able to keep in. Most missionaries have a German shepherd or two or maybe a Doberman or two that will sound the alarm if someone tries to breach the perimeter wall. Now, if any of you have been to a third world country, you're not going to be shocked by this or surprised at all. But let me tell you that I slept much better many nights because I knew that wall was there, those dogs were inside, and it was not going to be easy to get past that boundary. Not that it couldn't be done, but it was going to slow somebody down. And that is the story of when I came to appreciate that sometimes boundaries, strong boundaries, are good things. And that doesn't just apply to physical boundaries. It also applies to all kinds of other boundaries, including the personal boundaries that we set up in our relationships with one another. And boundaries to God are nothing new. In fact, do you know that boundaries, God established boundaries in the very first chapter of the Bible? Genesis chapter 1. Let's take a look. No, go, go to Genesis chapter 1, not this yet. I know I'm probably skipping around on you. Find that Genesis 1. Well, it says Genesis. No, there you are. So this is chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he did what? He separated the light from the darkness. In other words, he put a boundary around the times for light and the times for darkness. And he even had a name for the boundaries. He called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning. How many days in are we before God sets up some boundaries? We're still on the first day. This is what God does. And, and we can see a whole list of things. So I, I made a little list of all the boundaries in Genesis chapter 1. Show that bulleted list. He separated or created a boundary for the water above. Back in the early days before the flood, there was a blanket of water surrounding the earth from the water below in the oceans and the seas. He separated the seas with land in between. He created boundaries, which we call coastlines. He separated day from night, sea creatures from air creatures, livestock from wild animals, humankind from everything else because it was the crown of his creation. And lastly, in Genesis 1, it says, and this is one that's going to bother a lot of people, God created boundaries between males and females. Boundaries that lots of people want to break down nowadays and say there's no difference whatsoever. And if you're a male and you want to be a female, well, become a female. That's okay. Or if you're a female and you want to be a male, become a male. That's okay. Except it ignores Genesis chapter 1 where it says very clearly, God created men and God created women distinctly, separately in their own individual categories. And there are boundaries between the two. Now, what I'm going to preach to you, as you can tell already, is going to be a little touchy. Are you ready for that? Today's message might get a little bit touchy, so let me warn you and talk a little bit about last night. We live in a fallen world. 
And we're going to talk in just a minute about a sinful idealism and optimism that basically teaches you to believe that people are essentially good. And I use that word essentially purposely because by essentially, I mean basically. I mean at their root, in their heart. You are going to hear over and over, people are good. And I love the optimism of that. I love the idealism of that. But it contradicts everything we know from Scripture. People are not basically good. Now, are you ready for this? What are they? Essentially, from, per, from birth, people are basically sinful, that is, evil. And who does that include? We'll see in just a moment. But you're going to notice in this account that I'm going to show and read to you right now, the idealistic point of view about human nature doesn't work. Laban was Jacob's relative, his family member, his father-in-law. And not only Laban, but Laban's sons and daughters get jealous and envious and begin to attack Jacob. So let's, let's read it. And what we're going to hear from God toward Jacob is we probably need some boundaries here. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father, which, by the way, was a lie. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. This is the Lord saying, I think we need a little space. I think we need a boundary. I think you need a perimeter over there and Laban will have a perimeter over here. Later on, in fact, Laban chases Jacob down when, when he is taking all of his possessions, his wives, his grandchildren away, and they literally set up a stone pillar that they name Mizpah, which means watchtower. This place is here as a witness and a watchtower that you're over there, I'm over here, and ne'er the twain shall meet again. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Lee to come out to the fields where his flocks were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before, but the God of my father has been with me, as he had promised. You know that I've worked for your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. This is all true. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. If he said the speckled ones, meaning the lambs, the sheep, the goats, will be your wages. Then all the flocks gave birth to speckled young. And if he said the streaked ones will be your wages, then all the flocks were streaked young, bore streaked young. So God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to me. And Rachel and Leah replied this a little bit later. Now, verse 14, do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? You see, what they're going to say is we see it too. Jacob, this is not just you. Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children, so do whatever God has told you. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all his livestock ahead of him, along with all the goods he had accumulated, accumulated in Paddan Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Not actually a very good move. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he was running away. Also not a good move. It's called deception because he didn't have the guts to stand face to face with his father-in-law and tell him what he was about to do. This, this is an important lesson. In the, in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4, 
Paul writes, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. I'll say it again. Put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Jacob didn't do that. So he fled with all he had, crossed the Euphrates River, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. This is almost to the promised land. Then God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Even God with Laban is reinforcing the boundary that needed to be there. There's a book. I'm going to show you a picture of it. How many of you are familiar with this book? Have you read this book? It's a, it's a dynamite book. A lot of Christians have read it. If you haven't read it, you might want to read it because as we talk about setting up personal boundaries today, not just physical boundaries, you may be asking yourself, but how can I do this in a way, like Paul says in Ephesians 4 also, where I can speak the truth in love to people that I do love? And so I want to set a boundary but I also don't want to be a jerk. Well, Henry Cloud and John Townsend give you a lot of practical tips in this book about how to establish personal boundaries without being a jerk. And he, here's one thing that, that uh, Cloud and Townsend say. You can put that next quote up. Boundaries are basically about providing structure. This is so important for us to know. God created boundaries in Genesis 1. Why? Because our world needed structure. And structure is essential in building anything that thrives. Do you want your family to thrive? Ask yourself, does it have structure? Do you personally want to thrive as an individual? Ask yourself, have I established the boundaries that create structure in my relationships? And so this is so important to understand that boundaries are not meant to make you a meanie grumpy puss. They're there to help create the structure that actually allows your relationships to thrive. And that's why we can say, and I'll show you in a few minutes, that even Jesus had boundaries. The Son of God himself. So let's start with point one. You're, you're going, finally, we're going to get to point one. Here it is. <laughs> the idealism of being boundaryless. I talked about this a, a moment ago, but I want to come back to it. Take a look at when Jacob... And Laban were trying to live boundaryless. They had all kinds of difficulties. Put, put up Genesis 31, 1 and 2. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our fathers. You see, for a long time, Laban and Jacob's flocks were all mingled and mixed together, and Jacob was taking care of them, so it didn't seem to make a big difference. It seemed to be the best thing to do. And then later on, they had to figure out an organization, a structure, a system for Laban to have his and Jacob to have his because there was jealousy emerging. Here's the ugly, sinful nature coming out. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Now, why did these things inevitably happen? I'm going to teach you a little Latin today. You've heard me say it before if you've been here enough. When I'm up to preach, it's because of this thing. Put that Latin up there. They need to hear this. Homo incurvatus in se. When we talk about the fact that humans are sinful and evil by nature, this is what we're talking about. This little Latin phrase goes all the way back to the early church fathers like Augustine, 
Martin Luther made liberal use of it many centuries later, but it means a person curved in on oneself. Ever since the fall into sin, and in fact, if you listen carefully to Satan's temptation of Eve in the Garden of Eden, do you, do you hear what he said? Eve, why are you, do you really trust that God means what he says? You will not surely die if you eat of this tree. Don't you, think of yourself, want to be like God, knowing good and evil? The very first temptation was to get Eve to curve inward in her heart and in her mind toward herself. Selfishness, self-centeredness. And so when you hear the word sin, the very root of what we're talking about is that we're all born selfish, self-centered. And so it's absolutely a way out of line view to say people are basically good. How can people basically be good if they're basically selfish? They can't. It's never going to happen because always I'm going to put myself at the center of my universe, not God and not you. And that's inevitably like it does with Laban and his sons create conflict. So what we're talking about is this idealism of people are basically good so we can all just live together in peace. That's a utopian view that is equally an impossible view. It will never happen until heaven when all believers through Jesus Christ are welcomed into God's eternal kingdom. There it can happen, but here it will never happen because we are all people turned inward to ourselves. We're selfish and self-centered. Let me show you. Psalm 51.5. Surely I was sinful when? Just absorb that for a second. Now we're going to go earlier. Sinful from the time my mother, help me. I'll make it very plain. When the sperm met the egg, what sparked into existence was a sinner. An evil person from the very word go. And by the way, study this, there's an actual spark when the sperm meets the egg. We're sinful from the time. Or, this is not me. Look, this is an unpleasant truth. I wish I didn't have to get up here and preach this to you. There's a, there's a huge part of me that loves being brightly optimistic, idealistic. That, that is the very definition of Jeff Gunn. I hate having to say, hold on there a minute, because the Bible says we can actually do ourselves a lot of harm by being that idealistic and optimistic about human nature. We need to get real with ourselves. Now, how many people from infancy, from conception, are sinful? The Bible tells us. Next verse, Romans 23. For blank have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's your answer. What's the word in the blank? This is why, sadly, not only for organization, but for peace and safety, boundaries are needed. Now let's go to Donald Trump last night. Wouldn't it be nice if a presidential candidate could just stand up in front of a, a crowd of people who wanted to hear from him and be safe? Wouldn't it be nice for any presidential candidate, whomever you support, to be safe from the constant verbal attacks of people 
that go beyond the pale. Now, I, I don't mind if you go against any candidate based on his policies. Of course we're going to do that. We have to examine them honestly. We have to talk about them. But we have become a country of people who have zero heart boundaries when it comes to attacking one another. Go on to social media. And I hope that you'll see, and I, I, I want to just passionately prevail upon you, that we need boundaries. We need boundaries to our gossip. We need boundaries to our meanness. We need boundaries to the parking lot discussions, even at church, that, <laughs> that attack people behind their back much less perimeters to protect a presidential candidate from being attacked. And that's why we have to say good boundaries are necessary because, and here's your fill-in, there are no utopias in life. Amazing love's not a utopia. It never will be. America as much as you may love this nation, is not a utopia, and it never will be. And the realistic point of view is to understand that one of the big reasons good boundaries are necessary is because from conception, all people are fallen and sinful. Let's go on to the next point. Let's talk about the health and blessing of boundaries. It's not just that they're necessary. It's actually that they're a big blessing to us and that they can help, help us be healthy. And maybe some of you can relate to this quote by Bill Gaultier and see what the problem of no personal boundaries looks like in our lives. Tired caregivers. Now, I, I, look, pay attention here. This is a person who cares deeply. Others matter to him. God matters to him. Tired, however, caregivers often have trouble saying no and avoiding speaking the truth in love. They, they don't want to put off falsehood and speak truthfully to their neighbor. They are more readily drawn into trying to rescue other people and without realizing may end up enabling selfish or irresponsible behavior in the people they're trying to help. They may get so enmeshed with the people they care for, trying to continue to please them and walking on eggshells for fear of upsetting them, that they lose themselves. Now, keep that up there for a second. There's more to this. Anybody relate? Losing yourself might seem like a good thing, like, oh, self-sacrifice. But in reality, unless you're taking care of yourself, what, what you always hear every time this example is used over and over, you're on a jet plane, the mask drop, whose mask do you put on first? Can't lose yourself in that situation because you so love your spouse or your children. Put your own mask on first. Okay, let's go. They lose track of what they need and what's important to them. They're not good stewards of themselves, their energy, their time, their money, or what God has called them to do. They forget sometimes they're people on a mission. At some point, they may realize that they're not being their true God-created and god redeemed self. And whenever that happens, that's not going to be a good thing because you can never live out your purpose in life from that base. And so the Lord, noticing what was happening to Jacob, not wanting this to happen to him, said this. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. Now, this is actually a repetition of a promise made a number of times, not just to Jacob, but also we can go back just a few chapters and we'll see this and I will be with you thing popping up with Isaac. Let's, let's go look at that, Genesis 26. 
the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, this is Jacob's dad. Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. I've given you boundaries, Isaac. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you here. You see, often God sets boundaries for us, and you'll see this very explicitly in Acts chapter 17 in just a moment. Why? Because he has plans for us, and he promises within those plans and within our purpose that he will be with us and will bless us. Boundaries are actually a beautiful thing intended for God's presence and blessing. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, actually his, his father, which is Jacob's grandfather. Promises repeated over and over again. Now, do these apply to us? Very much so. Let's look at Acts 17. This is Paul now talking mainly to Gentile people to persuade them that if they will step within the boundaries of faith and of following Christ, blessings in God's presence are going to happen. From one man, he, God, made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their time boundaries in history and the boundaries of their lands, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Why does God want us to have boundaries? Personal, physical, time boundaries? He explains the big why right here. How does God want you to use the place that you live right now? How does God want you? What purpose has God put around the time frame he's given for your life? Why does God even say, when you're taking care of others, self-sacrifice like Jesus is good, but don't go too far and lose yourself in the process? Because even personal boundaries are meant as a blessing from God to give you space to do what? You see, I can so lose myself serving everyone else that I forget God has me here to seek Him and find Him and serve Him, though He's not far. But you know this. You... Phil could be standing right next to me, but if I have my attention on everybody else, I probably won't even notice that Phil's there. I'll say, how'd you sneak up on me, Phil? Don't let God sneak up on you. He's not far. He's near all of us, but we have to pay attention. There, there's people here at Amazing Love who told me things like, I think I moved into Frankfurt just so I could attend Amazing Love. And they're right. I think I'm here right now with these people in this time frame because they're such a blessing to me. And they're right. God has conspired to bring all these elements together for you and your benefit so you can seek him and find him and serve him. So write this down. God uses boundaries to show us his presence, and you could even add his promises. Let's do point three. And finally, talk about not just the health and blessing of boundaries in general, but the wonder the amazing wonder of God's boundaries. So, Cloud had another quote I really liked in his book about boundaries. He tells us, in short, boundaries help us keep the good in and the bad out. They guard our treasures. I love that. And God's boundaries all the more so because they're God's and he wants the good to be in and the bad to be out. He wants us to have his treasures 
forgiveness, eternal life, his grace and forgiveness. He wants those treasures to be deeply owned by us and protected by us. So let's take a look at Genesis 31. We're going to do a couple selected verses. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before. This is Jacob talking to Rachel and Leah. But the God of my father has been with me. See, Jacob's like, I still remember his promises, even though Laban has been against me. God is not. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him he was running away. So that doesn't mean Jacob is perfect yet. Certainly isn't. He's still far from perfect. He's still, as we talked about last time I was up here, a work in progress. Then God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream at night and said to him, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. You see, Jacob is... It, or, uh, God is saying to Laban, I'm going to be the protective fence around Jacob, so be careful. I'm going to be those little spiky things on top of the gate. I'm going to be the electric wire at the top of the wall, Laban, so please be careful. When you approach Jacob tomorrow, watch your mouth. Because he's mine. He's my child. And I will protect him. I will hem him in for good. I will, for Jacob, keep the good in and the bad out. You don't want to be placed in the bad category in that exchange. And isn't it beautiful to hear that? Because what, what, what do I say, Dustin say, almost every week during the confession of sins through faith in Jesus Christ, you are a, you can probably say it with me, dearly loved child of God, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's who you are. And that's not just a pet phrase. That's reality. That is who your father, your heavenly father sees you as. His child, his dearly loved child. His holy child, fully forgiven, all sins erased. And he embraces you, and just the same as he made this promise to Jacob, he makes it to you in grace. Not because you've done anything to deserve it. Shoot, Jacob didn't deserve it. He's still struggling to stop lying. And yet God still makes these promises to protect him, to love him, to be present with him. And whatever struggle with sin you're having, whatever sins you thought of during the confession today, whatever sins you're, you're, you're thinking, will I ever, ever, ever beat this? I wonder if Jacob didn't think that about being deceptive. God loves you. God promises you his presence and his protection and his power. That's who he is, a gracious God, a God whose love knows what boundaries? Knows no boundaries. That's who he is. And so if you, if you look, the, the Bible even tells us in Romans 5.20, however big your sin grows, but where sin increased, what's the boundary of God's grace? It will, it's boundless. It will always grow to meet the size of your sin so that it can be forgiven. Now, this is not an encouragement <laughs> to sin all you want. This is a comfort for you when you're struggling with sin and you're wondering, like Jacob, am I ever going to beat this? Is this ever going to go away? to know that God's grace is bigger than your sin or my sin. So write this down, the last point. God's boundaries are a wonder because they are all intended to keep the good in, God's grace in, and the bad sin out. And what's your next step out of all of this? Well, number one, even before we get to this one, I want to prevail upon you based on the events of the last 24 hours and based on what we were taught today. 
dispel overly idealistic thoughts about the human race and about yourself. There's a reason we all need Jesus. Desperately need Jesus. And it's because we are sinful and we struggle daily with our sins. And only Jesus can heal us. Only Jesus can heal the broken world. But the printed next step is this. I will study all of God's boundaries and align my boundaries with his so that I can enjoy his blessings. And there's one more unprinted one, especially because it came to me kind of in the middle of the night last night. I know, you're thinking, how long? This is it. This is the last point. (laughs) How are we ever going to get our country back? Not by fighting. We're going to get it back by sharing the gospel. Going after the lost, as we say in our mission statement, because every person that that doesn't know Jesus, that comes to know Jesus because of our witness, through the teaching of the scriptures and understanding God's boundaries, are going to come and understand better the country that we all need. And, and, and let me tell you, remember those pictures at the very beginning with the walls? And the, shh, do you know how long that took to happen in Zambia? 30 years. It was not that way in the 60s. By the time I was there in the 80s and 90s, all those walls were built and all those gates were built. And it had not been that way. If we don't pay attention to our environment, it doesn't take long. The men's group is reading about prayer. I want to prevail upon you on the basis of this message. Pray for this nation. And then go out there and evangelize as many citizens as you can. All right, let's let's say the Apostles' Creed. I promised you I'd end, and I'm going right now. Apostles' Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's say a brief prayer. Father in heaven, help us to know you, your boundaries, to love and appreciate them, to know you and your boundless love and grace and to appreciate that and help us, Lord, to pray for our country. We we pray right now for full healing for Donald Trump. We pray right now that you would protect all of our leaders and that you would watch over them. And Lord, we pray most of all that you will help us to take your gospel to our nation and to our world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Jesus taught us to pray this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.